we were unable to get it up and running until Josh came in yesterday for his for his talk. Oh, we weren't worried at all. We weren't worried at all. <laughs> <laughs> a couple trips to the hardware store. Yeah. So uh, with that as an introduction, I'm going to turn it over to Josh and let him tell you what Refugee is all about. Yeah, well thanks Mark. Um, thanks to the museum for having me, um, and thanks to Charlotte and Mark for hosting me. Uh, lots of good food and drinks so far, and good company. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the background of this piece, some of the history that ties into my own family's history. Uh, spend some time talking about the process uh, involved in creating this work, and then I'll also talk a little bit about some of my own work along the way. But I think that these kind of talks are very useful um, when possible, optional, to have a conversation, right? Um, art doesn't really do its work until other people, the viewers, the listeners, are involved in that work, right? Um, so at any point, feel free to you know, jump in with your own experiences or even questions or anything like that, because I think um, this work, I think, or at least it's intended to tie all, uh, all of our experiences together. It's, it's more or less um, a universal experience. So just out of curiosity, um, are there any first generation uh, people here from um, that, that have immigrated to the country, first generation? Second generation? Third generation. Well, we've got a couple more visitors coming up. Okay. So no, that's might. okay. Yeah. I don't know. So so beyond third generation, for the most part. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So do you have in your family? Um, I'm guessing you probably have a photo album, or maybe it's a big bucket or bin of photos somewhere. That well, what in in your in your family in in that history? What is the function to you that those photographs play? What's the role? Why do you keep those photographs around? Personal history. Personal history. Other thoughts there? And so what does that history capture? Memories. Memories, right? Yeah. Is that an accurate or is it a full or complete history or, yeah, history, I guess. No, they're moments. Yeah, they're moments, right? And so, and so what do we do with that information that is left out? Um, so. In, in my experience, uh, my dad's side of the family immigrated here in 1949. They came here under the Displaced Persons Act. Um, so my grandfather and my grandmother met uh, in a work farm in Germany. They were routed up by the Nazis. My grandmother is Ukrainian, my grandfather is Polish, and they met um, on this farm where they were working. Um, they proceeded to uh, have my father, um, and then when he was, I think, one or two years old, um, the, the farm that they were on um, was uh, liberated and it became a displaced persons camp. Essentially, they were sort of mutually disowned from their families because um, it was mostly because of religious reasons, but Ukrainians and Poles did not marry. That was taboo at the time, and my grandmother and grandfather were um, uh, uh, sort of outcast at that point. So they didn't have anywhere to go, right? So they, they were taken from their homes, um, and they're in this displaced persons camp. And they're living there for a few years um, after liberation, uh, after the end of the war. Um, and then through the Displaced Persons Act, there was a church in Sauk Center, Minnesota, so pretty much the smack in the middle of the state, that sponsored them to come uh, to, to settle in the country. Um, and that's, um, that's what they did. Um, so I grew up hearing these stories from my dad and my grandmother that um, were often very traumatic, kind of dark. Um, and. They were stories and experiences that I couldn't uh, resolve in myself. I couldn't place myself in those stories because, right, I was born in the United States, born in a you know comfortable middle class situation, um, and I'm hearing these stories and I'm trying to locate myself in that. Um, so there are some pictures in our family archive that really sort of triggered some of these, um, some of this interest to me in terms of trying to connect myself back to that family. And so this picture here, I don't know how well y'all can see it, but it's a, uh, it's a, a clipping from the Sox Center Herald, small town newspaper. I think at that time there was, the town was maybe only about a thousand people or so. 
and it is a photo of my grandparents and my father and uh, two of his sisters um, praying, and it's at Christmas. And the caption talks about how they are so thankful to be in the United States and how they are um, adapting, they're learning to talk English and learn the ways of, um, of US um, society and our culture. Um, and so, you know, I'm looking back at that, thinking about my, my own situation, just trying to um, connect to that. Um, similar with other photos, uh, this is a photo of my dad and his sister, and this was actually taken in Sachsenhausen, Germany, at, in the displaced persons camp. So this is a Christmas photo before they immigrated here. Um, and so I'm in grad school um, studying, I'm doing my MFA, um, and I'm introduced to um, some theory by a, a historian uh, by the name of Marianne Hirsch, who coined this phrase or this idea of post-memory. Um, and what I discovered is that she was talking about exactly that kind of disconnect that I was experiencing. So she writes about, mainly about um, the Jewish diaspora, right? Talks mainly about the result of uh, the ensuing generations resulting from the Holocaust. So people who experienced the Holocaust, people who were survivors of the Holocaust, move to the United States or elsewhere, right? So the diaspora, people move to new locations, and then their families that they have there, they grow up sort of in this, uh, hearing these stories, part of this history of these extremely traumatic events, and that those later generations don't uh, find an easy way to locate themselves in that. I was like, okay, this is kind of where I'm at now. My family, they weren't Jewish, they weren't Holocaust survivors, right? But they were survivors of a very similar um, experience being sort of put into these this forced work separation in, um, in Sachsenhausen, Germany. So um, with post-memory, there's a couple of things there that, I'm, uh, that I became very interested in. Knowing that I couldn't, that I didn't know all of the details of the stories I was being told, um, I was keen on finding those gaps and filling them in between the family archive of the photographs and the oral histories that have been passed down. Basically what I started to realize is, okay, that's actually not impossible. And instead, um, there is this process uh, that Hirsch says uh, post-memory is a powerful form of memory precisely because um, its connection to its object or source is mediated not through recollection, but through imaginative investment and creation. So for me, it's that, that imaginative investment part, right? So um, uh, knowing, I, I did a series of uh, oral histories with my dad where we would just sit down and I would just get him talking just as much as he could remember. And he'd talk, 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 and you could kind of see things being sort of invented in that moment, right? Um, uh, as he's trying to fill in the gaps himself. So that kind of led to um, some early work uh, specifically dealing with this idea of post-memory, and it's the first time that I worked with Ash. I and mean, I'll talk a little bit more detail, um, in detail about Ash later, but uh, the first piece here was Descendant, where I took all these oral history recordings of my dad and played them through boxes and the um, speakers in boxes. The boxes were urns, they were filled with ash, the vibration from the sound would cause ash to fall down in the space where these pyramids would start to build up, and then you could kind of watch the ash flow down. We'll talk a little bit more about the, um, the kind of... Um, the, the, the logic and the reasoning behind the act when I get to that a little bit later. Um, the other thing that I'm, I'm interested in, I think, in terms of uh, that time-based uh, component of this kind of work, so the fourth dimension, right, um, that Mark alluded to, um, is this uh, idea of anticipation that can build um, in, in viewing work like this, but also work that takes extremely long durations of time to unfold or to complete themselves, right? The, police, the, the, the piece changes over time. Um, and so another piece that I did uh, after Descendant is this work called Anticipating Yesterday that just uses the sort of me metaphor of water dripping from a ceiling, um, and over time you, uh, you sort of watch that droplet build and build and build until it finally releases. It falls into an old pan that's in this old, you know, beat up piece of carpeting, and then there's a soundscape that starts to ensue there. So I'm just going to play um, just a couple of seconds of this just to, uh, again, frame that anticipation part a little bit. 
So this is the the droplet as it builds up. So. So what happens is, over time, the, uh, each droplet that comes down, it um, becomes part of a rhythm that builds up over time, and it slowly kind of crescendos. It takes about five minutes for it to go through the cycle. It slowly crescendos um, with each droplet until finally there's a final droplet that kind of kills the whole thing. It reverts back to silence, and then that process starts up again. And with each loop or each iteration of that, it's never the same, right? Every, every water droplet sounds a little bit different. Um, and so when people come into the space, um, if they decide to stay for the duration or if they just kind of come and go, they're always going to hear something different and unique that unfolds out of that. I'll just kind of forward here to towards the end. Did you compose this music to it's, go with this? So it's all actually generative. It's happening in real time. Oh. We'll talk about that in just a second okay. here. Oh, cool. So, um, so yeah, that's. Uh, Kind of part of my process that I'm interested in is also, I, I should have mentioned that earlier, is generative work, right? Like um, work that you sort of set up a series of rules within which the work has to unfold. And it sort of abides by those rules. And then at a certain point, you as the artist, you sort of make the rules and then you sort of tip the first domino and then you just let it do its thing, right? And that's kind of what's happening here is it's not... Um, it's not composed, it's something that, based on the sound of each droplet, it all happens in real time. So there's a little bit of programming involved there, mm -hmm. um, as well as the sculptural components. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, just talk a little bit then about the, the process of this piece, because I think many artists will tell you that there is a huge difference between what you have in your head and what you're sort of envisioning there and how awesome it might be in your head. You're like, oh, this is going to be great. And then you make it and it's kind of just really bad. And you're maybe really <laughs> kind of disappointed with yourself or whatever. Um, and so Refugee was very much um, kind of the result of a process like that. So basically um, what happened was uh, when I first started at Hamlin, actually, there was um, uh, an opportunity to with one of my colleagues to do um, an iron pour. Um, and I had never worked in a foundry before. I had never done any uh, metal casting of any sort. Um, and so it was an opportunity where basically I didn't have to pay for any of the materials or anything like that. I just would have to do all of the labor that was involved in that. So I had this idea where I was going to make um, casts of a whole bunch of fingers and I was going to have this kinetic thing where there was a bunch of drumming fingers that they would just sort of drum in a circle. Um, I'm not really sure exactly, it's been long enough now that I'm not even sure what I was going for there. Um, but it wasn't until I got to a certain point in this process of building this thing where I was like, there's no way this would be a piece that would take several years for me to complete because it was just so labor intensive. Um, but one of, one of the um, elements of my process and practice is just experimenting and playing around with technology and sometimes getting ideas that way. And so um, one of the things that I teach um, at the university is what we would call critical making. So working with sort of digital and analog hybridized tools. So programming, a little bit of electronics, in this case working with um, uh, actuators to make kinetic work, in some cases sensors, right? And sort of tinkering around with that, and this is just the early, one of the first 
pieces of documentation that I made when I was thinking about this of a little, uh, it's just a solenoid that just I can program to trigger every once in a while. So I had this idea that I was going to make all these fingers and they were going to um, sort of drum in this pattern. So I went through the process of, you know, working with the latex, making a mold of my fingers, right? And this was all stuff that I had never done before. Um, then taking positives of the fingers in the molds, chopping them apart, ended up with 48 fingers. Um, and then that goes into the sand molds um, for the iron, um, for the actual core that itself. Um, and so at this point already, before we even got to that point, I probably have close to 40 hours of work into this. There are the negatives. Um, we don't actually see the vias that were carved in there, but um, here is the, um, the kind of end result and the actual pouring of the work. Um, so while I didn't get to be on the floor for this, unfortunately, it was a very kind of tightly controlled environment, and plus it was an opportunity for students to do the pouring. Um, we go through this process, the fingers get poured, I end up with 48 of them, and has anybody done um, iron casting before? And so you know how rough the it's work rough. turns out afterwards. Yes. And so I see this, and I, you know, the sculptor that I was working with kind of warned me about that. She's like, well, it's not going to be very clean when you get it out. You're going to have to clean it up. And since I hadn't done this before, I didn't really know what that meant. Right. And so this comes out, and I'm like, holy cow, like, basically, I have to sculpt a finger now. I basically have something that's sort of in the rough shape of a finger, but all of the detail, or the majority of the detail, was lost. So um, along the way, I'm kind of playing around with, all right, how am I going to get this thing, these things moving around? Around. I'm playing with different mechanisms, uh, with uh, servos, and eventually for the first version, I kind of settle on this mechanism, uh, in this case using a servo, where it just lifts and drops the finger, and that seemed to get me, give me the kind of motion that I was going for. Oh, obligatory picture of my cat. Um, uh, I'm, I'm in, interested in... Um, uh, digital fabrication, so a lot of the work here was done with um, CNC machines, so a combination of using CNC and 3D printing. Um, here's like some early prototypes where I was trying to figure out, okay, what's this urn going to be like with the ash? How am I going to kind of make this work? Um, I'm just going to cruise through some of these. These are just, just photo documentation of that process until I get to um, the ash. I'm gonna actually. I'm gonna go forward just a little bit before I go back to the ash. So at a certain point, I get to where I have to clean up the fingers, and that was an extremely challenging task just for one finger. And I realized there's no way I'm gonna be able to do 48 of these. So I'm like, okay, now I have to reconfigure, right? So here's again sort of a rough idea of what that rough, uh, the the raw finger looked like. Um, and so I spent a whole bunch of time with like tools and a Dremel and everything trying to sculpt this thing down. So, um, so then I was like, all right, so what, you know, what am I going to do here? And I, as I was playing around with the, um, the mechanism, I realized that there was something in this gesture of the finger tap that, um, that it can mean a lot of different things, right? If you're having a conversation with somebody or maybe you're at an artist talk and if somebody is sitting there and they're sort of tapping their finger, that might indicate, well, like <laughs> maybe you're a little annoyed or maybe um, you're bored or maybe you're waiting for something, right? There's all these different um, things that kind of get wrapped up in, um, uh, I, I think, that, that gesture. And so I kind of wanted to explore that. Um, and so then I started thinking back to some of the earlier work that I had done with um, uh, the ash. And at this time, the Syrian refugee crisis was especially in full swing. It was always in the news. It's something everybody was kind of talking about. Um, and that, that led me to do you know, more research into just the refugee crisis around the world in general and started getting a better sense of just how much sort of human migration there is and how um, sort of offsetting or disruptive this is not only, as we've probably heard, not only to the people who are in migrating, but to those places that they are migrating to, right? We start to hear all of the these fears that start to come out about, um, you know, people who might be migrating from one place into a new community or a new country, right? So I'm thinking, okay, um, you know, how can the ash kind of become part of that? So um, for me, that, that ash is symbolic in uh, sort of several ways, I guess, where um, the ash, it's wood ash, first of all. And um, that, to me, is 
kind of a metaphor for that cycle of life, right? So if we're talking about burned wood, a tree grows, right? It dies, or maybe somebody cuts it over, it falls over, you burn it, um, and it becomes ash. So there's this remnant of that original story, um, but then it actually creates this kind of fertile soil that new things can sort of grow from. Um, so I was kind of working in that um, space, thinking about that post-memory process. Um, so I started to um, actually sort of manually filter all of the ash for this piece, which took a long, 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 long time because you have, of course, if you pull something out of a fire pit, um, in, in order to get the ash to be the sort of fine particulate matter that it needed to be to fall kind of nicely, um, you're going to have all of this sort of detritus, right, all this leftover material. Um, and so that was, I don't know, it's kind of a... Um, kind of a meditative process for me, I think, just that process of over long periods of time, sifting, 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 sifting. Um, and it's, there's also this other element of the ash that it is, um, it's made up of just, you know, billions, trillions of tiny pieces, tiny, tiny, tiny particles that on their own are entirely insignificant, but once they gather together, it becomes to form, it, it starts to form something more significant. Um, and so then that idea gets tied into um, uh, Refugee, the piece, where as the finger taps, again, either symbolizing this kind of aspect of waiting, or maybe it is impatience, or maybe it's even indifference, or boredom, or whatever, um, and with each sort of per, uh, repercussion of that, um, the ash falls down, and there's a lot of kind of detail in the small tendrils of ash that moved down. That experience actually came from, or that I should say, um, the idea for <coughs> wanting to work with falling ash came from an experience that I had with my mother's urn that I had put up on a, um, a, a shelf in my apartment. And one day I went <coughs> to take it down, I pulled it down, and there was this this little stream of ash that fell down and it just kind of hit the light just right and it looked really beautiful. You could see all this detail in it um, and it was just, there was just leftover ash from when we had spread her, her ashes and I was like, okay, that's kind of what I want to work with. So, um, so that kind of leads us through to that element of time where essentially what's going to happen with the piece here is over this extreme, like this is a long period of time, the ash pile is going to build up and build up and build up um, in the uh, vitrine. Um, there are processes of change that kind of go along with that. So once the pile starts to get to a certain size, um, it's almost like you can almost start to see sort of fault lines start to form and eventually you kind of reach that critical mass and it'll start to collapse and it'll reform itself. And what I'm hoping people will do is see the work it, in the early part of the process when there's just about nothing there, a very small little mound. Um, and then um, over several months, mm -hmm. um, come back and see how that um, has not only grown, but also how the shape of that, um, that sort of remnant of that experience is, um, has been reshaped, I guess. Um, are there any uh, questions so far about any of that? I don't, I don't know how long I've been talking here, about, yeah, just about a half hour, so I don't want to go much longer. Did Nobody you, uh, pick a specific interval time for the yes. tapping? Yes, thank you, good question. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, so the first time that I installed it, the tapping was way more rapid. It was once every couple of seconds, um, and so it went, it went through the ash very quickly. It annoyed the hell out of the gallery people. Um, <laughs> and so uh, I started kind of slowing it down. It's about once every eight seconds now. Uh, one of the first times that it was installed, it bothered the gallery sitters so much that they actually took a small little rubber pad and placed it <laughs> under the finger, um, which was a little annoying yeah. for me because the sound is very much a, a part of this, right? There's kind of that repercussion or that, that percussive um, effect that I want to kind of echo throughout the space. And I'm noticing here, like, every once in a while when I talk, like, the sound kind of reverberates mm -hmm. nicely through that space down there, mm -hmm. especially. But, yeah. It seems that the faster tap has a different emotion too. Like yeah. The faster tap is that more like 
I don't know, I, I'm tired of this, let me make this thing stop, whereas the slower tap is, yep. it completely changes the meaning by changing. Yeah, that's a, yep, that's a great point. So right. what we've decided we're going to do for this is, um, to, after we're done here, I'm actually going to reprogram it to slow down pretty significantly. Um, again, I'm going to try a couple things, but probably about once a minute, um, so that that element of anticipation builds up a little bit more, and so that that process of change um, slows down, so that, that so that it can be up for eleven or twelve or maybe thirteen months, yeah. um, and that process is um, captured in that much more slowed down kind of pace. I think is the is the idea. Well, and also so the viewer can experience that waiting, mm -hmm. waiting for that finger to drop, waiting, that in, what's the next step, what's the next thing to happen, when's it going to come? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's all these things tied up in that waiting, right? Mm -hmm. So you're either waiting to find a home, like again, I tie that to my family, right? There was a point in time there where they literally had no home. I mean, okay, they, they lived in a displaced persons camp, but they that concept of home was completely mm -hmm. upended for them. You know, they didn't have sort of a permanent place that they felt that um, they could settle, and so they were waiting to find that, right? Mm -hmm. um, but also waiting for um, any n a number of other things, waiting for work. In my family's case, waiting for, you know, children, maybe waiting for um, other family members to welcome them back into the family. All these things eventually ended up happening again. My dad established a really great relationship with um, the family back in Poland and Ukraine. Um, about a year and a half ago, he found out, uh, he did a DNA test and found out that who, he, who we thought was grandpa, his biological father, was not his biological father. So he's 70 years old, um, he doesn't know who his biological father is, and those, um, those answers are pretty much gone at this point, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's the, the history has been so spread out. Um, he and I have done, well, he's done the majority of the research on trying to find that, but you know, there's there's really probably no way of him knowing. And unfortunately, you know, knowing um, what women went through in a time of war, it probably wasn't a great situation for my grandma. You know, like mm -hmm. like that made us realize that there was probably more trauma there than had been mm -hmm. discussed. Um, I, I just want to add to that too. There's you know, we're talking about memory. One really important element of memory and this idea of post memory is forgetting, right? So um, we intentionally want to forget things. When my dad started making contacts back to Ukraine and Poland, my grandmother, who was still here and alive, she was like, "Don't do it." She had she wanted nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. My grandfather, he burned photographs and documents when he came here. Um, got rid of that whole history. My grandmother was like. We are Americans now. We don't want, there's nothing good that can come out of um, exploring that history or letting that, that history follow us, you know? So there was a lot of tension between him and my grandmother, especially, that he had done this um, sort of work of bringing the family, bringing that history back to their present situation. Um, but ultimately it turned out to be good because there was a very healthy relationship that came out of, um, of him reestablishing contact with the family. Any other questions or comments or personal experiences to share? Well, I think the generation that's coming up now is more inclined to want to remember than even my parents' generation. Yeah. Um, because my parents really didn't want to talk about too far in the past. Mm -hmm. And it was only towards the end of my dad's life that he even talked about his experience in World War II. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is very common of World War II vets. Yeah. yeah, my dad was But even my mother too. didn't want to necessarily yeah. talk about the period when she lost her own mother and she, mm -hmm. you know, and then the stepmother came. So, I mean, there was a, I think, but my generation and forward, I think we all want to touch back to some place yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. to that memory. Yeah. And I think, I think we all look for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think but our current mode of sort of preserving or documenting everything digitally, whether it's through Instagram or even just all the, you know, phone phone pictures we might have or whatever, do you think that kind of plays into that desire Possibly. to Possibly. keep that history? Um, that and I think it's, I think the, the social media is just trying to reach out and be part of something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that it involves memory as much as 
this is what I'm doing today, someone take notice. Yeah, yeah. It's creative. Yeah. Well, and they show what they want you to see. I mean, you mm -hmm. only see what, yeah. Like, right. It, it's kind of a false reality because, I mean, you don't see it through their eyes. It's like you're, you're seeing someone else's um, preservation of a moment that may not really exist. Yeah. That's a very good point. Right. Yeah. You know, my grandmother on my father's side, she told these stories off and over and over again. And I hit 13 and suddenly they became a little more risque. Mm. And I said, oh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> no. I said, you never said anything like this before. She said, well, you're old enough to know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so memories so change. Right. Right. Exactly. You're not ready yet. <laughs> yeah. You've come of age when yeah. you can hear yeah. the stories. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I think, too, that um, that whole notion of waiting and waiting for your life or your life to be put back together can happen in so many ways. Um, I know my family that went through Katrina waited, waited for insurance companies to say, here's your check, or waited for the adjuster to come or waited for a contractor or waited the whole, I mean, they spent years waiting and, and, and to go down and immerse yourself in that environment, everyone was waiting. The, the waiting was palpable. It was just this suspension of time and place. And, and when you're going through that type of waiting, um, you're really removed from what's happening on an everyday moment to moment basis. I felt, I felt like, um, and that it's really the suspension of of travel, of yeah. a time travel right. forward or back. And you're kind of stuck. And right? you're stuck. Yeah. 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 Um, which is which is one thing we really kind of want to unpack in this gallery too. Is just that that wait, like when's this going to happen again? What? How long am I going to wait? Yeah. And I'm living in a nursing home now, and then, so over the years, as my life has contracted. Into the into a smaller and smaller space, I find myself my my patience being incredibly t tested because I'm waiting for someone. Yeah, I'm waiting yeah, for right. something to happen, or I'm waiting to get out of here for a few hours, yeah. or you know. But it's but you're constantly at this point in my life. I'm constantly waiting, and I've had to really develop a strong sense of patience yeah, that right. I didn't have, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but certainly have, have had to develop, and it's not pleasant. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, um, yes. I didn't really have a question, but I wanted to put something in there that uh, meant a lot to me. And my husband and I lived in Europe for a long time. And I played piano for a, um, a company, and they were all from Poland. And they had never talked to an American. No. So we became very close in that relationship. And when you're talking about these the people, I can remember so well how they loved America, and they and all of those emotions, constantly. They, they, they had the Germany, they had all of this, but I could hear their stories, and it was, it was incredible. Yeah. So it brings that back to me. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, and then, well, then there's the, uh, the desire for the people who came here from Poland to find a geographically similar exactly. area. That's exactly why mm -hmm. my family landed in Minnesota, is my grandfather was talking to the US soldiers who were uh, after liberation, he's like, we're looking at going to the states. What is the closest thing yeah. to Poland? And they said Wisconsin or Minnesota, and that's they found the I mean, church in Sachsen. You know, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, you all are invited to. You know, Josh will be here for yep, a while more if you out. want some one on one. Um, it's a tight gallery space, but we can all take turns going yeah. in and um, yeah. and enjoying the piece. And the piece will, or the, the gallery experience is going to change while it's up. We're going to add some more didactics and, um, and a way to interact because um, as, as the viewers experience this waiting, 
we're going to have some kind of feedback, either notebooks or post-its or some way that you can say, does this waiting make you anxious or does it, you know, what are you thinking about or, you know, just just how is this piece affecting you as as the viewer that we're really curious. Yeah. So, um, yeah. so come back whenever you're in the museum, just come just touch base back into the space and see how the ash has grown and changed and um, and what's going on around it. So. Yeah, thanks, Charlotte. And the last thing uh, I would mention, I, there, were, there were actually a couple of newer pieces that sort of grew out of this that I was going to show, but I ended up talking for a little bit longer than I wanted to. So um, my, I've got a, um, a portfolio online, joshgumiela.net. Um, uh, I'd be happy to show some of that work afterwards, too, if you wanted to hang around. But I have done some other work that kind of plays around with some of these ideas. So. Thank you all very, Thank very, you very all much. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much.